that they're very often working two or three part-time jobs, all part-time with no benefits. They can't support themselves. They can't pay their rent. They can't pay daycare. They need daycare so that they can go out and look for work uh, and so that they'll know that their children are safe when they are at work. They need transportation. The women at the shelter have to look for the jobs that they can walk to, and most of those jobs are minimum wage jobs, and they need health care. They need access to health care. Uh, because many are ill and they can't go back to work because they can't stay in a job because they keep getting sick. When they get a prescription from the doctor, they need to be able to go and have that prescription filled, not bring it to us and wait two or three days while we call every church in the community asking them, can't you help? They need that desperately. They need that to be independent, to be safe, to move out of the shelter. They need a shelter where they can live in dignity. And that's not what we have right now. We need to build a new shelter for our women so they can have some privacy to heal from what they've been through. And our victims of sexual assault, what they need from our government, what they need from you, every single one of you, is for you to believe them. If someone comes to you, a male or a female comes to you, and they tell you that someone has assaulted them, they need for you to listen and understand that yes, that is what has happened to them, and not question them. Not ask them, is that a real way? They need to hear from you that you believe. Thank you. Yeah, I'm telling you why. 
how they did that. Democrats had outvoted Republicans by approximately 400,000 in 2020. Number three, no more same day registration and out of precinct voting. Number four, say goodbye to straight ticket voting. This is the most significant change other than that of early voting. Every interested group must prepare thousands of sample ballots to assist voters who are used to straight ticket voting. Fifth, the fifth and last change is that they are inviting and allowing more partisans in the polling places to walk around challenging and likely intimidating voters. Now, I didn't know it doesn't take effect until 2016, and we will have we will have plenty of time to get ready for that. We must, however, develop plans now. We have almost two months, and all groups who have a stake in this coming election had better be ready to get out of the boat. We all pay taxes. The Constitution gives us the right to vote. Every one of us must vote. Must get your friends, your family, your relatives, your, and everyone you know. You <laughs> too. Doing all right. Checking in the thing. All right. We must deliver to these Republicans the defeat they so richly deserve. Thank you. God bless us all. God bless North Carolina. Thank you. The next speaker comes. We do want to thank the speaker, but we want to make clear we are here for justice. Whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, we are for justice. A wolf in sheep clothing not going to fly. Just to say you're a Democrat or just to say you're a Republican or whatever your party may be, we're going to look at what your interests are. No permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent <coughs> interests. But we do thank you, we do understand the climate that we're in, but we just have to make the record clear. We are here for justice, and that is a nonpartisan call to stand for justice, and that holds everybody accountable. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Pauline Finney Merritt, and I am a wife, a mother, a taxpayer, a registered voter, and a North Carolina teacher who teaches right here in my hometown of Cleveland County. I am here to speak on behalf of those teachers. I was appalled by recent political advertisements boasting the largest teacher raise in North Carolina, led by Speaker Tom Tillis and Governor Pat McCrory. It is almost laughable that they want to take credit for this raise, which was a last-ditch effort. Initially, they had proposed a bill that would pay the top 25%. And I don't know how they were going to determine the top 25%, and neither did they. So therefore, a federal judge put a uh, indefinite uh, sanction against that proposed bill. Legislators, I'm directing uh, my attention to the legislators, as a mother of two young children striving for college, I wish that I could see great benefits of that 7% raise that was given. As you know, only those recently entering the profession received a substantial increase. Others with even more seniority than I saw very little. So what about the late nights, the neglect of family, and much needed weekends off for all those years and the six previous years without so much as a gesture 
for the cost of living. Veteran teachers received no appreciation. We are frustrated that every year our legislators come to us and ask us to do more but pay nothing. I don't even know if that's legal. Teachers deserve more because we cultivate the most precious commodity that North Carolina produces. are in the trenches, and everything that you do to keep their spirits up will make for happier, healthier, and more knowledgeable students. We are losing great teachers, and we're losing them in droves. The great state of Texas even has its own website for North Carolina teachers. The profession no longer has its luster. I'm tired of seeing pity in faces when people find out that I'm a teacher. Please know that most of us are not in it for the money. We are in it for the children. But you cannot keep sending down requirements without paying us for our hard work and our work that lasts even after the bell rings. Thank you. Sidewalk over there, 
Church, we are going to call the show name. We say to ourselves, we're at home here. Don't we? Yes. This is our place. But lately, I've been feeling really uneasy that this may not feel so much like home here in Cleveland County and in North Carolina. It's not quite the way it was. Things have changed. We're not at home. Somehow our trust in one another has eroded. That trust that seen us through a lot of things over a long time, and many of you out there remember it. How in the world did it get to be that we here in Cleveland County and North Carolina are divided over the right to vote? That is absurd. It's nonsense. We are going for a lineage of our Cleveland County. We respect the right to vote. But here we are, we're faced with the state legislature majority that says it doesn't trust us to vote honestly anymore, even though we always have. So restrictions like photo ID have to be rules. When I go to vote in 2016, Lord willing, and you gave me short days, and uh, when I go vote in 2016, I'll have to prove that I am at this Oakworth community. That I am. It's an insult to me to have to prove who I am. I've never lied before. I've never tried to sneak over to Dean Westmoreland's precinct and vote there. And then we have the merging of precincts here in Cleveland County. Our Board of Elections has shrunk precincts down from nine to five. And we are faced with the fact that many of our members are going to have to go to a different voting place or not know where to go. So what we must do is not only go to vote ourselves, but take our neighbors, help those who are most vulnerable, who may not know their voting place has changed, who may not know, who may not have heard, who may not have a way, tell it in our churches, in our communities, in our coffee shops, vote, vote, vote. They may not hear us in the elections board here or the legislature in Raleigh, but they will hear us in the voting booth. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank you. Let's give all our speakers a hand. Now, how many of y'all know that God held back the rain? Because we have a great man that's about to speak to us. Let's give Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, the second, the North Carolina WCP State Conference President and the Fall Together Mar Movement leader, a big hand as he comes. Let's give him a hand.
Mayor's leaders, if you would come up. I give to you the greatest president in the nation, Reverend Dr. William Barber. Say we the people, united, can never, never be defeated. Come on up a little closer if you would as we move in, as we come as one people. We're streaming all over the nation and the truth of the matter is, you all are the greatest people in this nation, the Forward Together Moral Movement, because you are setting standards and the North Carolina Conference of Branches and the NAACP and all of our partners give it up for you. And we thank God most of all. Give God a hand. Amen. To this President, Reverend Murphy, we thank God for him and his outstanding leadership for my district director who constantly works with us, who is a double D, a Delta and a district director with the name called Degree. Degree, you need to be over here. Mary, you need to be over here on my left shoulder somewhere. To my friend and sister who's not here, Nancy Petty, who wanted to be here with you, who's from uh, Cleveland County. We thank God for all of you and to the great leadership this year. Let's give it up for Ms. Yara Allen, who just sang, who is a culture artist. My friends, I want to talk with you a minute, because we invited all of you here, not just to be at a rally, but to deputize you as organizers over the next days until October the 10th, and then in, in early voting, and then right on up to November 4th. Touch your neighbor and said, you're going to be deputized tonight. <laughs> I want you to know it's time for a moral march to the pole. Yeah. Somebody say, if, if we ever needed to vote, yeah. we sure do. Need to, vote now. need to vote now. See my past president over there to my right. That's right now. We're together. And I want you to know what the mantra that ended up like in the Moral Monday movement. You see all these folk around me. That's unusual sometimes because a lot of times when people come, they come to the podium by themselves. But at Moral Monday, no one ever stands alone. It's about all of us Democrat, Republican, black, white, gay, straight, young, old, rich, poor. It's about all of us who make up America and who make up North Carolina. But my friends, let me first say some things to all of us. Even in the highest turnout year in modern times, which was 2008, more voters in North Carolina turned out married than any other time in modern history. You know, even with 70% of the people turning out, 30% of registered voters in North Carolina didn't even cast a ballot. That equates to 1.7 million registered voters. We can do better. In 2010, the so-called midterm election, participation in the election dropped from 70% to 55%. Or well, excuse me, 55% didn't cast their vote. Only 45% Rodney cast the vote in 2010. We got to do better than this. Now we can blame part of what happened. On the Tea Party and on Alec, they sure put a lot of money in Art Pope, who over the past few years has spent nearly 40 million. That's my friend, you're from Cleveland County. Hey! I'm sorry, we, we gotta thank y'all, we gotta thank now. That's my sister right there. She helps me preach everywhere I go. He spent over $40 million of his money. But it's also true that the enthusiasm among voters did not match the enthusiasm of the Tea Party. And they count on low turnout. They cannot win when the people vote. Back in 2010, the biggest segment of the population who used early voting was white Republican men. And the second greatest number 
in 2008 were black Democratic women. The drop-off in midterm elections has huge consequences. Tell you maybe it costs you when you don't vote. There are about one million adults in North Carolina who voted in 2008 and 2012, but didn't vote in 2010. That's dangerous because what the president does doesn't hurt you as much as what a legislature does. Because those closest to you hurt you the most. So if you're only voting for the president and then you don't vote for the General Assembly, you get this sniggity sniggity stuff that we got now. I wanted to say something else, but sniggity came out. I, my Pentecostal came out, I was talking in tongues. Sniggity. See, see, in 2010, 400,000 white women didn't vote. Where, where my white women sisters? Some of them say, well, hey, so, say, say, we got to do better. And then 280,000 African Americans didn't vote. Where, 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 the, where the brothers and sisters, huh? What up, what up, what up, what up? Say, so we got to do better. In addition to that, there are 800,000 North Carolinians that aren't even registered. Somebody said, Lord, help! And, and, and while I want to laugh, there's one word, there ain't but one word that you can say about that, and my grandmama taught it to me. It's only one word. Trifle. Republican and Democrat, but with 800,000 people whose lives are going to be impacted by what people just choose not. That's the problem. Now, now, let's, but some folks say my vote doesn't matter. Okay, well, let's see what happened. When you didn't vote in 2010, you allowed extremist legislation. You know some of these guys and gals only got elected by 12 votes? There's a legislator down in Pasco County that has been one of the major extremists in the General Assembly, 12 votes. What happened since then? What about the This General Assembly has taken our step state backwards. I was in Mississippi not too long ago visiting with Mary Evers and the NAACP board. I got off the plane, went to the hotel. When I walked in, and I'm sorry, preachers, y'all pray for me later, but I'm going to say exactly what they said to me. Somebody said, Barbara! I said, how you doing? Man, what the hell is going on in North Carolina? <laughs> said, we from Mississippi used to look up to North Carolina. We used to want to be like North Carolina. What's going on, man? <laughs> what happened when folk did vote? Or voted too little? You got some representatives. I can talk about them. I ain't gonna tell you who to vote for, but I'm gonna tell you how they voted. Tim Moore, that one of y'all. Uh, Kelly Hasty, and uh, Senator Warren Dang. They represent Cleveland County. And this is this is this is this is public policy 101. Now they followed. They they followed. They followed Lock, Stock and Barrel, Tom Tillis, and Phil Berg. They followed them. Whatever the leadership said, do they did. Now now watch what happened to you. Not to North Carolina, but to Cleveland County. First of all, the crowd I just made them sit in there. Tim Moore, Kelly Hastings. Senator Warren Daniels, Tom Tillis, Phil Bergen, McCord. That's hooked together. Yes, yeah, an emergency. That's why I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm getting ready to tell you. Y'all got your right, right sound in Cleveland County. Exactly. That's right. It's an emergency. Because the first thing I want to tell you is they refuse Medicaid coverage in North Carolina. For, and and, and meant, that means that 500,000 poor and working poor people are going uninsured. 
and 2,800 people will die this year because of what? Moore, Haston, Daniel, Tillis, and Berger, and McCory did. Now, now, now listen to this. Listen, there's a report that just came out. It's a nonpartisan report. It says that in the 24 states that have not expanded Medicaid, 6.7 million residents who would have been insured are no longer or can't, are not being insured. Hmm? That the states that denied Medicaid are foregoing $423 billion. You hear what I'm saying? That the hospitals in these states are slated to lose $167 billion. The Robert Wood Foundation said that the state, this state, will lose nearly $40 billion in Medicaid funding and more than $11 billion in reimbursement to North Carolina hospitals. Y'all have a hospital here? You ought to go talk to those administrators and ask them how they are hurting because more Hastings, Daniel, Tillis, and McCory denied Medicaid. Rural hospitals are being hit so hard. We've had a hospital close and others thinking about closing. And the North Carolina Hospital Association has said that 2,000 employees have lost their jobs as a result of the denial of Medicaid. Now, they make that, some of them want to make you think Medicaid is just for poor black folks. But you better wake up here. You better wake up here. Don't, don't believe that racial division stuff. When you deny Medicaid, you hurt black people, you hurt white people, you hurt Republicans, you hurt Democrats, you hurt independents, you hurt North Carolinians. <laughs> Medicaid expansion would have created 25,000 new jobs. Because the program brings more than fifteen million dollars, billion, billion, billion dollars to help. Now watch this. Let me break it down a little bit further. In Shelby, Lenore, and Morganton, twenty-three thousand two hundred people would have benefited from Medicaid expansion. I mean, you get that now. Get that. You have legislators who voted to deny twenty. 3,000 of you access to Medicaid expansion. If Medicaid expansion had happened in North Carolina, it would, it would have cut the uninsured rate in Cleveland County by more than a third. Y'all hear me, preachers? And that's why I tell preachers, if you're concerned about healing, you can't just put oil on folks and lay hands on them. You better deal with these legislators that are keeping folks sick. Uh, but not only that, not only that, take my time today, I feel all right. More hasten. Daniel, Tillis, Berger, they tried to give millions of your tax dollars to private schools. Schools that can resegregate. Schools that can discriminate and hire. And they would not even accept any amendments to, to disallow that. And the only reason it got stopped was because of a judge. Now they should have known better because Article 12, I think it is, Section 12, I believe it is, of Article 1 of the state constitution says that public education in North Carolina is a constitutional right, and North Carolina's constitution says you can only spend public dollars on public school. <laughs> this, this same crowd, what, what's, what's their name? Moore, Haston, Dan, Daniel, who? Tillis? Berger, McCoy, they, they read the elections with redistricting and all these voter suppression laws. They cut funds for public school teachers, cut health programs for women and children. That, some of the stuff we haven't even heard in the budget is so deep inside that budget. They cut
cut money for the policemen. They cut money for police department and court systems. And they, they continue to block uh, the overturning of GS 9598, which is the law that says policemen and firemen can't even have unions. They shifted the taxes. They said they were going to cut taxes, but they raised taxes on 89% of North Carolina so they could give 11% of our post friends a tax break. In a state where it seems like every other year somebody's being exonerated from the death row. They chose to overturn the Racial Justice Act, which simply says if you prove somebody was, was, was persecuted or incarcerated because of race, they don't get out of jail if they're still guilty. They just get life without parole. And we know that the capital punishment system is broken. Huh? Listen, Moore, Haston, and Daniel, Tillis, Berger, McCord, and you notice I haven't called them That they, they run under the, 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 the title Republican, but they are extremists. Watch this. They cut in the first two weeks 900,000 working people's earned income tax credit. In other words, they raised taxes on work. And now, notice I didn't say black, did I? I said 900,000 huh, working. Now, they might try to fool you and make some of our white brothers and sisters think, you know, well, we're cutting these things because some people don't deserve it, entitled it. Well, lest we forget, as that Confederate statue say out there, we ain't in the Confederate no more, y'all. We all together now. You might have a statue up, but we ain't paying the statue no mind. We understand that when you cut 900,000 people earned income tax credit, you hurt Republicans, you hurt Democrats, you hurt white, you hurt black, you hurt everybody. And you're not a Republican. When you do that, you're an extremist. Why? Because Ronald Reagan supported earned income tax credit and said it was one of the best programs to help eradicate poverty. So when you make Ronald Reagan look like a liberal, <laughs> That's pretty bad. George Bush supported earned income tax credit. George Bush, one and two. Clinton and President Obama. You see, these are extreme. They change workmen's compensation law. Yeah. To help corporations and hurt workers. When people were down and out of their look, Reverend Gatewood, they cut 170,000 people's unemployed. People who lost their jobs with no fault of their own. That's not Republican. That's not Democrat. That's just me. That's all, that's all I did. Yeah. And in Cleveland County, let's come home again. With the unemployment benefits, when they cut it, 790 jobless workers in Cleveland County not black workers, jobless workers, yeah. lost their federal unemployment insurance. Yeah. That meant that one in five of all the jobless workers in Cleveland County lost their unemployment. Wow. And those workers did not lose their job because they didn't want to work. They lost their job because jobs had moved and the textiles had moved. Am I telling the truth? In Cleveland County, there were 10,345 taxpayers who used the earned income tax credit. The earned income tax credit would have benefited families that have a total of 14,192 children. That means if they got $250 of earned income tax, they might be able to buy some milk or buy some school supplies. But these legislators, what's the name? More? Uh, Hasten, uh, 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 Daniel, Tillis, Berger, and McCory cut earned income tax credit. Extremism. And then they fast track, frack it. They want to frack up your water. Just frack it up, frack it. And, and, and I, I guarantee you they won't be frack.
fracking near their houses. They won't be fracking near the governor's mansion. They won't be fracking wherever they stay. Wherever the fracking goes on, it's gonna happen in poor white and poor black and poor community and rural community. And they got the nerve. I'm gonna put out something about Duke Energy. They support Duke Energy. I mean, I mean Moore and Hastings. You know that, that crowd. Moore, Tillis, Berger, McCoy used to work for them. Support Duke Energy on this coal ash. And again, you won't find those coal ash ponds in any the affluent communities. Everywhere those coal ash ponds are, they're in that poor communities. Poor black, poor white. And then they put out a study saying it's not that hard. So I said, and we said in the Forward Together movement, if coal ash is not that harmful, get you some strawberry and blueberry, put it in a bullet, make you a smoothie, and you drink it. <laughs> now, young people, and y'all don't even want me to start talking about Patrick Henry. Matt Henry. I ain't telling you who to vote for, I'm just telling on him. He opposes raising the minimum wage, supports giving public education funds to private schools. He's against the Affordable Care Act. Even though the Affordable Care Act protects people with pre-existing conditions, like my daughter who has a brain condition, your representative would rather my daughter not have access. And he supports privatizing Social Security. Now our young people a few weeks ago helped us on this. They were they were looking at these issues in light of what happened in, in down in um, um, Ferguson when an unarmed boy was shot by a policeman. And they, the young people, lifted from history the words of Coretta Scott King when the matriarch of the movement said, "You know, when you talk about violence." You got to do more than just talk about shooting. The shooting is a form of violence. But Coretta Scott King said poverty is a kind of violence. Yeah. And a society where the powerful step on the poor, that's violence. Yeah. Starving a child is violence. Yeah. Suppressing a culture is violence. Yeah. Neglecting school children is a violence. Yeah. Hurting teachers is violence. Discrimination against the working person is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical needs is violence. Taking people's health insurance is violence. Contempt for equal protection under the law is violence. And even the lack of willpower to help your brother or sister is a form of violence. Otto Swarma at MIT calls it attention violence. It says when you get power and you only care about the powerful, that's a form of attention violence. And as the young people were teaching us, Dr. Sadler, I could not help be reminded of God's word. Well, God has a lot to say about politics. And, and I just thought I'd tell you he's got something more to say than what the so-called right wing wants to say about abortion and prayer in the school and homosexuality. In fact, let me help some of y'all on that. I'm going to deal with it today. Ain't no scriptures in the Bible about prayer in the school. It's about prayer in the house and in the home. Huh? Huh? And, and all those other things, there ain't but about four or five scriptures at the most that even speak to the issue of, of, hom of homosexuality. And at least four of them are misinterpreted. And not one of them trumps this scripture. No matter where people are, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Shine on the just and the unjust. And if anybody here wants to call somebody else a sinner, and if that's what you want to call it, that's you, not me, but if that's what you want to call it, and they claim they don't deserve grace, well, you talking about yourself. Because ain't none of us here without some struggle somewhere. And in a, in a society, equal protection under the law is for everybody. It, it doesn't 
I'm not saying if you black or if you're white or if you gay or if you straight. We say one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. But, 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 that same Bible has 2,500 scriptures about the poor and how you treat women and how you treat the children and how you treat the least of these. So I get real concerned when folks say they're conservative because conservative means to hold on to the essence of. So if you only focus in on five scriptures that four of them you misinterpret and you're ignoring 2,500 scripture, you're not a conservative, you're a liberal. I'm a conservative because I want to conserve justice and conserve love and conserve treating people right. So I couldn't help the other day when the children were talking to be reminded of what Ezekiel said about violence. Ezekiel 2010 says her princes in the midst of her are like wolves. The leaders, they shed blood. They destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Her prophets have dogged them with untempered mark. Lord have mercy. The people, the leaders of the land have used oppression and exercise robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. They have oppressed the stranger. Proverbs 22 says, don't take advantage of poor people just because they're poor. Don't beat down those who are in need by taking them to court because the Lord will stand up for them in court and your whole society will come to ruin if you mess over the poor. Jesus said, when I was hungry, did you feed me when I was naked? Did you clothe me when I was sick? Did you come see about me? When I was in prison, when I was thirsty for any so much, you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Do these, I want you to know, I, I, I'm not questioning, but I'm wondering, do these politicians, the ones that represent you here in Cleveland County, that make so much to do about being Christian, that make so much to do about putting their left hand on the Bible and raising their right hand to God, that make so much to do about righteousness when it comes to prayer, the school, the abortion, and homosexuality. I just want to know, do they even read the Bible? Do they even know what public morality looks like? Do they know what love looks like? Do they know what justice looks like? Do they know what democracy looks like? Then I got another question. Have they even read their own constitution? I mean, if you swear to uphold something, you ought to know what you're swearing to uphold. You know what that constitution says? I'm talking about ours, the one that the governor swore to uphold, and, 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 and uh, um, what's his name? Moore, and Warren, and what's that? Hastings, and Tillis, and they swore to uphold it. It reads like this. Of the state of North Carolina, grateful to Almighty God, the sovereign ruler of nations, for the preservation of the American Union and the existence of our civil, political, and religious liberties, and acknowledging our dependence on Him for the continuance of those blessings to us and to our posterity. For do for the more certain security thereof, and for the better government of this state, ordain and establish this Constitution. And then it says, We hold it self-evident that all persons are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among which is a life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor and the pursuit of happiness. Section two, all political power, not some, all political power is vested in and derived from the people and all government of right originates from the people and is founded upon their will own should be instituted solely for the good of the whole, not the good of our poor, not the good of a lobbyist, not the good of any one party, not the good of black folk, not the good of white folk, but the good of the whole. Oh. When you look at that, then denying health care is violence. Denying public education is a form of violence. Denying unemployment is a form of violence. Denying living wages is a form of violence. Raising taxes on working and poor people is a form of violence. 
It's psychological violence, it's social violence, it's political violence, it's constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, historically insensitive, and economically insane, and we can do better. I still believe that we can be the land of the long leaf pine, the summer land where the sun does shine, where the wheat grow strong and the strong grow red. Here's to the down home. The old North State. In Cleveland, the whole country is watching. When you look at the extremist policies of our governor, Corey Tillerson Berger, and your legislators, the only conclusion when you look at what they've done is several things. Either they don't care about the Constitution, and they're, they're so drunk with power and so paid by their financiers that they are merely puppets being controlled by rich puppeteers. Or they really believe hurting children and teachers and the sick and workers and the poor and trying to stop voting rights is really a path to a better society. Yeah. And that's scary. Yeah. Or they believe their own lives. Yeah. You know, like you cut a billion dollars from public education, you fire teachers, you didn't claim a 7% raise, but then you undermine it by cutting another people out of teacher's salary. And that, and you've actually raised. I mean, if they believe that, if they actually believe, or more importantly, believe you will not believe, that's the ultimate insult. And then if Tillis thinks that after doing all that, he can now run as a moderate. Hmm. Yeah. Berger put out a phony budget, said that the moral Monday budget would cost seven billion dollars. He didn't even think we were going to fact check that. We know the worst thing you can do is be loud and wrong, so we sent our budget right over to the North Carolina Tax and Policy Center, and guess what they found out? The Forward Together Moral Monday movement not only would, would is tax revenue neutral, but it would actually increase revenues in North Carolina. So whatever their rationale is, I don't know, but it's strange. And what I do know is is extremists have hijacked the Republican Party. Yeah, these ain't Republicans, because see, Franklin Delano, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt believed in living wages and labor unions and education. Eisenhower believed in public education. And Eisenhower said any party that attacked public education and labor rights and unemployment and social security would not look soon be a party. Benjamin Hooks used to be the, used to be the head of the NAACP was a Republican. He believed in voting rights and public education. Jackie Robinson was a Republican. He believed in labor rights and he believed in justice. So what we have here is a hijacking. And now I want to tell you what I think we got to do. You see, voting doesn't solve everything, but it's essential. Say essential. And right now we must have a moral commitment to a movement that's not controlled by Democrats, not controlled by Republicans, but it's controlled by what's right. What's right morally and what's right constitutionally. Bottom line is democracy is hard work. You gotta work at it. You gotta work every day at it. You can't give up. Turn your neighbor and say, you can't give up. If it rains, you can't give up. If it snows, you can't give up. You gotta stay in the game. And so the first strategy of our movement was to shift the conversation. That's why not a thousand people went to jail. We didn't just go to jail, go to jail. We wanted to shift the conversation. Any, any more money rest in here? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, hi. Give my hand. We wanted to change the conversation. And do you know after 75 weeks now almost of, of, of challenging them, the governor, when we started, was at 50% in the poll. Now he's at 30 and falling. The legislature was at 40% in the poll. Now he, they're at 17 and falling. When we started, a lot of North Carolinians were confused, you know, because they had scared people and they had said they were going to raise, they were going to cut taxes. But the more we got together, the teachers got together and the unions got together and the environmentalists got together and the healthcare advocates got together. Now, now, 58% of North Carolinians say we should accept Medicaid. Over 50% oppose giving public.
public school money to, to private schools. 54% of North Carolinians would rather raise teachers' pay than cut taxes. Over 50% of North Carolinians oppose fracking. And 77% of North Carolinians say that Duke and any other company should pay for their cleanup when they mess up our lives. We have shifted the conversation. Country neighbors said the conversation has been shifted. People are talking a different way. You ever seen anything like this in Cleveland County in front of the, in front of the courthouse? Look at the diversity in this crowd. You ever seen this kind of gathering around the Confederate statue? Somebody ought to say praise his holy name. Look up here, look up here, all of us together because we have changed the conversation. But now secondly, we said we were going to fight in the courts. Because in this state, we're seeing a modern form of interposition and nullification. That's not just against the federal government, but against our own North Carolina Constitution. And we're seeing people attack. When they attack immigrants, they are attacking the principle in the law, equal protection under the law. When they attack women, that's equal protection under the law being attacked. That's a fundamental principle, 14th Amendment. And it's in our state constitution. That's why our lawyers are battling in the court. Mayor, we're battling over education. In fact, we just won working with the Justice Center two weeks ago. We're battling over redistricting. We're battling over voter suppression. And since I happen to be the elected president of the NAACP, I come to tell the state president and the district president that before I came here, I made a call to our lawyers to dispatch them to Cleveland County to deal with this change in the precincts and election. Too far to be played with now. But our third strategy is for a moral movement, and that is to mobilize and register the vote. We had 40 young people in 47 counties this summer registering people to vote. We just launched a voter registration campaign over the radio and doing the same with social media. We have now more than a thousand ministers that are hooking up with a campaign called Let My People Vote. And now, we need you. Touch your neighbor and say, I told you you were going to be deputized. The deadline to register people to vote is 10 10 14. Say 10 10. 10, 10. 14. 14. That's October 10th. 14. We need you now to register everybody you know. Every church, every club, every over How many of y'all in the church? How many of you in a club? How many of you in a sorority, a fraternity, anything? We need you to hold three, say three. Voter registration drives between now and October the 10th. Are you going to do it? Touch your neighbor and say, nobody playing. It's time to mobilize. But then we need to deputize you to do one more thing. Touch yourself. Say, self, you got to get 25 people. You got to register everybody you know. If they ain't registered living in your house, register them. If they won't register, kick them out. I mean, register everybody. You gotta teach your dog how to say, That's serious, y'all. Touch your neighbor and say, Neighbor, you gonna get your 25? Tell them I'm counting on you. Tell them I'm counting on you. Tell them we can turn this county upside down and turn it right side up. But not only that, early voting, say early voting. The deadline, wait a minute, my president, the deadline is 1023. Say 1023. On the 23rd of October, Mr. President, I'm asking you and your ministers and all this crowd, number one, to get at least 51 of your friends to go with you for early voting. That's in honor of the 51st anniversary of the March on Washington and the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. Because you know, when, before the Voting Rights Act was signed, white women could not even serve on juries. See, that's the history we have been taught. But I also want to ask you, Mr. President, and all of these folks that are here, you ought to have a march on the first day of early voting. I don't care where they put the poll. You ought to organize now and walk that day. And what if in 50 counties we have people marching on October 23rd? And then every day after that, march to the polls. Vote early. We 
you want a million voters to go to the polls early. If you're mad about our elected leadership, you better register your votes and vote. If you don't like politicians hiring political puppeteers like Art Pope, letting them do their damage and then they resign and they don't have to be around when the trouble comes home and the chickens come home to roost, you better vote. If you're tired of seeing public policy that hurts the poor and workers and teachers and education, you better vote. You better send a message. You better change the center of political gravity if you still believe that our politics can be just and they can be fair and they can be whole, that shalom, as my Jewish friends say, is possible. If you still believe that children can be educated and the sick can have insurance and poor people can be respected, we better come together and vote. Now, Mary, I didn't plan to be this long, but y'all so fired up down here. Y'all done messed around and I done felt my head come. Well, I got to finish. I want you to know that if we come together, we can change situations. I know it from history because in Seneca Falls, in 1848, Elizabeth Canton State got together with Sojourner Truth. And when they came together, they changed America and won women the right to vote. In the 1800s, labor unions brought workers together. And when they got finished, we had the AFL-CIO. And they won and helped workers. In the 1900s, A. Philip Randolph brought black Pullman Porters together. And when they finished, they changed racism inside of the union and outside of the union. Come together. Tell your neighbor it's time to come together. 59 years ago, August the 28th, Emmett Till was killed 